Welcome to the History Maven. This video is part one of our countdown of the 10 most outrageous Beatles theories and scandals. But before we take this wild ride, please note this video is for entertainment purposes only and the claims within should not be taken as factual. Number 10. Secret Offspring in 1984, Bettina Krishpin, a German woman who claimed Paul McCartney was her father, took him to court for blood test. DNA paternity tests would not become available until 1988, so the courts relied on blood type testing. They determined that Paul was not the father. Bettina said, Paul must have pulled a fast when submitting another man's blood sample. She is still demanding a recount. The BBC has listed another German woman born in 1965, Christina Hegel as a daughter of John Lennon, claiming that Christina has John on her birth certificate as her father. John's uncle Charlie accepted the woman, who chose to remain anonymous, as his great niece and he remained in contact with her until the end of his life. However, a Hamburg newspaper later found a copy of Christina's birth certificate and said John Lennon was not listed as her father. It said that this woman is just an eccentric Lennon fan who moved to Liverpool dressed like John and changed her name to Janina. In fact, the Beatles were not even in Germany in 1965. But could it be possible that the Beatles have unknown children out there? Paul did say the guys would share the affections of four or five ladies a night while touring in the early days. It's been suspected that Paul alone made love to five of the 600 women prior to his marriage to Linda Eastman and we know Papa McCartney has no fertility issues. So what are the chances that Macca has loved children as out of wedlock babies were known then? Let's look at the odds. One in 20 unprotected sexual encounters between young men and women or 5% end in pregnancy. So if he made no attempt to ward off conception and he had 600 encounters, he would have 30 kids, give or take. Birth control became available in 1960 and about 47% of sexually active women utilized the pill prior to the 1980s. That would reduce the number of potential babies to 14. The latex condoms have been on pharmacy shelves since the 1920s. In the 1960s, 42% of sexually active men used condoms. If Paul was religious in his condom usage, which is 98% effective, he would have no kids. But let's say he used condoms only 42% of the time, with the 47% of women who took the pill and 53% that did not. He would have six to seven children. And if all four of the Beatles each ejaculated into 600 women, the chances of there being at least a couple of secret offspring is statistically probable. Number nine, the CIA killed John Lennon. On December 8, 1980, John Lennon was shot and killed by Mark David Chapman as he was entering his apartment in New York City. Several people saw Chapman shoot Lennon, and Chapman made no attempt to flee the scene, nor did he deny committing the crime. Chapman listed several reasons for the assassination over the years, including the fact that John Lennon had told the press that the Beatles were bigger than Jesus in 1964, that John Lennon was a hypocrite who was living large while preaching no possessions. And he also claimed that he knew he would tie himself to John Lennon forever in killing him. But of course he had to give the oldie but goodie excuse too, the devil made me do it. It is known that the FBI kept a file on John Lennon in the 1970s and attempted to deport him for his political activities, such as participating in the rally to free John Sinclair. Sinclair was a poet and activist with the White Panther Party, a.k.a. Rainbow People's Party. Sinclair had been sentenced to 10 years in prison for marijuana possession. John told the press that he was being followed by government agents and his phone was being bugged, and in time this has proven true as the FBI records had become available. But a theory grew that John Lennon's constant efforts to shake the system made him a target for the CIA, and that Chapman was programmed to eliminate Lennon. But listen to what John Sinclair had to say about his friend John Lennon. He just retreated when the government came after him. Reasonably enough, he was trying to stay in America. The government was trying to send him back, so they withdrew from activities of any kind. John's political rally days ended, and so did the president's efforts to deport him back to England. At the time of his murder, he was one month away from gaining U.S. citizenship. It does not make sense that the CIA would feel the need to deport Lennon 
or to have him killed nine years after he ceased serious public criticism of the American government. Lenin had spoken against Vietnam, but that was over. In fact, from 1975 to 1980, John was mostly quiet, considering himself a stay-at-home dad. And if you can't beat them, join them. By 1977, John was working with the FBI to bring down a terrorist group in Puerto Rico who demanded large sums of money from the Lennon family. They threatened to hurt John and his family and to blow up random citizens with explosives if he did not fork over hundreds of thousands of dollars. If we were to assume that Mark David Chapman was carrying out this assassination on behalf of a group, it would be more likely that it was this terrorist group involved than the CIA. But, by all appearances, John Lennon was murdered by a mentally ill fan who wanted recognition and attention. In Chapman's own words, he said, I just sought a way to be someone I wasn't, to be loved. Number 8, George's Night with Ringo's Wife. Marine Cox met Ringo Starr when she was just 15 years old. She was a Beatles fan fighting the crowd of girls for Ringo's attention at the Cavern Club. They struck up a friendship that turned to romance, and by the age of 18, Maureen was expecting her first child and walking down the aisle with her idol. After several years and several children, Maureen found herself alone often, while Ringo was out making music at first and then drinking and enjoying the affections of other women later. Despite the neglect and Ringo's sometimes violent alcoholism, Maureen and Ringo loved each other very much. But Ringo wasn't the only one telling Maureen that he loved her. Smooth-talking George Harrison had been making jokes that he was in love with Maureen for years, even in front of Ringo and then Mrs. George Harrison, Patty Boyd. Patty said, I became aware of the affair when she would turn up at midnight and she'd still be there the next day, Patty said. I'd have to be pretty stupid not to notice. <laughs> Some girls. It was toward the end of our marriage. Patty ran right to Ringo and she spilled the beans. For a time, Ringo and Maureen tried to make it work, but Ringo finally pulled the plug on their marriage. He said, There's no one snap thing that did it. It spread out over a year till you found yourself at the end of the year saying, What are we doing here? This isn't a marriage anymore. And I had a fine marriage for eight and a half years. I had a really fine marriage, which I worked for and she worked for it too. And it just started slipping away. Ringo later apologized to Maureen for leaving her to fend for herself and for his unfaithfulness. When Maureen grew ill with cancer at 48, Ringo was there for her. After Maureen's passing, Sweet Paul McCartney composed a song, Little Willow, in her memory. This scandal, by all accounts, is true, and yet it's not really a scandal at all since in a great show of maturity, all of the parties involved managed to forgive one another and remain friends. Number seven, the fake Beatles. This is one of the Beatles conspiracies that actually has nothing to do with John, Paul, George, or Ringo. 1964 was the year that the Beatles hit big and toured the U.S. It seemed every teenager in the world was clamoring for a glimpse of the Fab Four. Bob Yori was a manager of a squeaky clean doo-wop group called the Ardells when Beatles mania hit, and he had an idea to capitalize on the trend. Bob had the Ardells change their sound and their clothes and comb their hair down. He dubbed them the American Beatles as a bit of a joke and the Ardells were invited to the biggest hit teen music show on television, American Bandstand. But that's not where Peruvian entrepreneur Rudy Duclos saw the band. He stumbled into a Florida club where the American Beatles were on stage and he thought to himself, this is a pretty good tribute band. It struck Rudy that if you hadn't seen a lot of TV or press photos of the Beatles, you'd be fooled. And that was just the case in South America. Rudy had a hunch he could sell the American Beatles in South America as the actual Beatles. World traveled quickly that the Beatles were touring South America. Fans mobbed the American Beatles at the airport. A news station even kidnapped fake Ringo. I can't believe these guys had the guts to walk out on stage but they did, and as they gave their first performance in Argentina, they were met with some anger, some laughter, and a lot of tears when girls realized they wouldn't be seeing Paul McCartney. They kept on tour where sometimes audience members 
fought them as the real Beatles, and other times they were pelted with rocks. After two years as a parody band, the American Beatles went back to play more serious music and they gave themselves a serious name, Razor's Edge. They actually landed a minor hit under the new name with a song called Let's Call It A Day Girl. It hit number 77 in America in 1966 and 57 on the Canadian side. If you want to learn more about the American Beatles scandal, there's also a documentary called The Day That The Beatles Came To Argentina. I'll link it and a lot of other sources and info for my entire video in that description box below. Number six, Georgia Guidestones. In the late 1970s, a man under the pseudonym Robert C. Christian commissioned the Elberton Granite Finishing Company to create an American Stonehenge on behalf of a very secretive group of, in his words, Royal Americans. The structure contained instructions for a post-apocalyptic world, and it included some of these guides. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony in the infinite. Some people believe the first two guides were actually endorsing eugenics, the study of selective breeding, and one of the principles of Nazi Germany. The guide stones were met with so much controversy that someone took it upon themselves to obliterate the monument with explosives in 2022. But the mystery of who commissioned the work remains. Theories have pointed to Rosicrucians, perhaps, Christian Master Masons, that is, or even to Satanists. Ted Turner himself, the founder of CNN, has also been accused of commissioning this work. But where do the Beatles factor into all of this? A theory emerged on Reddit and other platforms because where else that asserted that John Lennon commissioned the Georgia Guidestones. The idea seems to be based on the notion that some of the guides resemble topics discussed in Lennon's solo masterpiece, Imagine. Mostly the no religion and no possessions aspect, which are common principles in communism. The ninth guide is to prize truth. Truth in one's personal life and in politics was something Lennon preached regularly. He even titled one of his songs, Gimme Some Truth. Another thing that people nod to as a fact that John Lennon might have uh, commissioned this is that John Lennon's wife Yoko Ono wrote a song in 1993 called Georgia Stone in which she praised the stone's call to rational thinking. Now I have combed through interview after interview looking for evidence that John said anything even close to quoting these guides. I have not found anything. I did however find an interview with John and Yoko on Dick Cavett where John said he believed overpopulation but joke the way uh, people myth. have uh, made this overpopulation thing into a kind of myth. I don't really believe it, you know. I think whatever happens will balance itself out and work itself out. And it's all right for us all living saying, oh, well, there's enough of us, so we won't have any more. Don't let anybody else live. Mm. I don't believe in that. I think we've got enough food and money to feed everybody. And I think the natural balance, even though old people will last longer, I'm sure there's quick. enough room for us. And some of them can go to the moon anyway. The joke, the way uh, people have uh, made this over. The Georgia Guidestones bear the inscription, Let These Be Guidestones to an Age of Reason. Age of Reason was the title of a pamphlet by American revolutionist Tom P Thomas Paine, and Paine detailed the problems with organized religion in his work. A quote from Paine, I believe that the religious duties consist in doing justice, love, and mercy, and endeavoring to make our fellow creatures happy. Paine was inspired by the humanist movements of France and Italy, and I suspect that these stones were erected on behalf of an American humanist group and not on behalf of a member of the Beatles. Thanks for joining me for part one of the Beatles theories and scandals, and it only gets weirder from here as we count down to number one. Check out part two for some legitimate weirdness regarding our Liverpudlian superstars, and be sure to encourage my lazy ass to step up my YouTube game by liking, subscribing, and leaving a comment. Maven out!